Mr. Darrell David. <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, digital technology and the internet have radically changed the film and media industry by democratizing how media is produced, distributed, and exhibited, and have also altered the way we consume media content. Take, for example, Netflix, which was once regarded primarily as an online streaming platform that provided traditional film production companies another alternative channel for exhibition. With funding and rapid development and growth, Netflix now produces its own films and dramas, which it shows on its own platform, thus completely circumventing traditional distribution and exhibition channels. In light of such disruptive evolution to the film and media industry, and in light of changing social norms, it is timely that the government reviews the Films Act to ensure that it remains relevant in the age of digital media. I'd like to focus on three main areas in my speech. The first area is the co-classification of films. Section 19 of the Act provides for individuals to be registered as Film Content Assessors, or CAs, to administer the classification of films. This provision is, in principle, a positive one, as it signifies a more collaborative and consultative approach towards film classification. Now, this would benefit distributors and audiences in the long run because of the wider range of views incorporated as part of the classification process and the increased number of film industry professionals who now have been trained to classify films. However, I do have some clarifications that I hope that the Minister can help me with. First, while the Act describes the procedures to apply to be a CA, it does not specify the type of qualifications one needs to have before application and who will approve these applications. I would hope that any required qualifications will not be too narrowly defined and the approval process not too tightly regulated. Second, I understand that the CA scheme might not be applied to all categories of films. Could the Minister please explain why that would be so and if we could work towards eventually allowing CAs to classify films up to a higher classification level, similar to those currently classified by the authorities. I would also like to ask under what circumstances the authorities would overwrite or reclassify a film already classified by a CA. And this topic of reclassification was raised by my uh, colleague, the Honourable Member, Mr. Zaki Mohammed. My concern, Minister, is that if the authorities were to do this too often, this could result in the public perception that the authorities only prefer CAs to rubber stamp ratings in accordance with the authorities' pre-approved guidelines and standards. Second uh, area, sir, is the appeals process. Now, any appeals for reclassification are currently being decided by the Films Appeal Committee, or FAC. Clause 12 in the Act amends Section 25 to modify the composition of this committee. It is encouraging to note that the FAC size is no longer fixed at 15, but is now stipulated to comprise between a minimum of 15 members and a maximum of 21, with an appointment period not exceeding a three-year term. I am supportive of this change as it ensures that the FAC can incorporate more diversity and the FAC gets refreshed on a regular basis. I would like to suggest, however, that the authorities strike a balance between refreshing the FAC too frequently and also in ensuring that the FAC retains some level of institutional knowledge about the appeals process. While such structured refreshment of the FAC ensures that new perspectives are being constantly brought in, I feel that the authorities can consider emulating the practices on corporate boards by renewing the tenure of some members beyond three years provided they can justify why the tenure of these members should be extended. This ensures that there is a good mix and overlap of new members and experienced ones, which will be useful should there be a need to rely on experience and historical knowledge when deciding on appeals. On this note, could the Minister also shed more light on the composition of the FAC and the process as to how members are selected? And does the government plan to engage the industry and films community to solicit nominees for the committee? I believe that in drawing some of the FAC members from the industry, this would be critical in ensuring that the committee has the endorsement and support from the community and also help strengthen the buy-in for decisions that the FAC would ultimately have to make. The third area, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, is that of films and national security. We've heard this debated in quite a few speeches before uh, mine. 
Clause 11 introduces a new Section 24 to deal with appeals to the Minister against a decision refusing to classify or reclassify a film on the grounds of national security. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, I spent more than 20 years in the media and communications industry, and I was also a media educator for almost 10 years. As such, I think it's fair to state that I understand the concept of creative freedom in the media and why it's important for us to get the balance right between allowing space and license for artistic creativity to grow and blossom, but not allowing carte blanche such that anyone can come up with a media product in the name of art or creative freedom that could have a damaging effect on a society or on a community. In my opinion, the government has been progressive in its attitudes and policies towards media over time since I began my career as a media professional in the early 1990s. And I believe that things will continue to change, both for those who produce media and those who consume it, to reflect changing societal norms, consumer tastes and preferences, and technological advancements and developments. But these changes need to be calibrated and measured, and there are some boundaries that should never be crossed. In a small, multi-ethnic, multi-religious country like Singapore, national security is paramount. And while most films do not openly preach violence against the community, we cannot ignore that certain plot lines could contain innuendos that may injure the feelings of some communities, or some films could have thinly veiled messages that are disparaging to a particular religion or could be viewed as legitimizing certain extremist views. As such, I echo the comments that my colleague, the Honourable Member, Mr. Ganesh Rajara, made and that I am supportive of the Minister having the authority to decide on all appeals regarding films and national security concerns. I was also heartened to hear Minister say earlier that he will seek the views um, and consult the Films Appeals Committee before arriving at a decision. However, I, I hope that the Minister will be willing to go even one step further and share with the Films Appeal Committee or even the public the reason as to why he would have made a particular decision regarding a film that might be deemed as a threat to national security. Such transparency would not only be illuminating, it would also be educational. While I'm supportive of the authority that the Act gives to the Minister, I would like more clarity on the authority that the amendments in Section 34A of the Act provide IMDA appointed enforcement officers. What training and processes have been put in place to ensure that these officers are equipped with the relevant knowledge to exercise their authority appropriately? And furthermore, how can we integrate this portion of the Act with other national security initiatives or measures that MHA and MINDEF might already have with regard to similar threats to national security uh, from film and media sources? Mr. Speaker, sir, this review of the Films Act is timely in understanding the changing landscape of the film industry and also helps to better cater to the aspirations and needs of filmmakers, producers, distributors, exhibitors, audiences, and the wider community. And indeed, my clarifications notwithstanding, I believe that the changes are largely positive. Nevertheless, I am aware of the sentiments held by certain members of the film and media industry that the amendments to the Films Act may stifle artistic freedom and creative expression and lead to self-censorship. I believe this was also raised by the Honourable Member, Mr. Kok King Leung, in his speech earlier. I would like to conclude by presenting the view that it actually takes more creativity and artistic innovation to create works of art that exist within certain parameters and boundaries. In fact, one could make the point that having those boundaries might present certain challenges that would inspire and motivate the artist to achievements that might not have been possible had those boundaries not been there in the first place. Indeed, legendary award-winning producer and writer Lorne Michaels was quoted as saying, to me, there's no creativity without boundaries. If you're gonna write a sonnet, it's 14 lines. So it's solving the problem within the container. So in the spirit of creativity within the container, I end my speech in support of the bill. Thank you, sir.